There are countless astonishing relics still to be unearthed in Peru, rediscovered within the modern age. Like that of Machu Picchu, long forgotten, engulfed by nature, still hidden within our past. With those which are rediscovered, simply dismissed en masse by cult-like actions of many of our modern institutions, most of which, at a loss to explain the advanced nature of many of these relics, simply labeling said sites as pre-Incan. Peru is home to some of the most exquisite polygonal stonework to be found anywhere on the planet. Additionally, some of this inexplicable stoneworking incorporated some of the most enormous of stones into their construction. Furthermore, the Inca Road, a ruin we have previously covered, long ignored and rarely discussed, it is the largest man-made structure ever found, dwarfing the Great Wall of China, stretching an astounding 25,000 miles, once connecting many of the most inexplicable sites found within the country. It seems Peru was once a very important place, and possibly the capital of a civilization now lost long ago within history. Many of the unexplained ancient ruins we cover also express a near obsession with the movement of the planets amongst the stars. And a huge portion of these ruins were either celestially aimed or had some form of astronomical significance built into their design. And our next subject of interest is of no exception. Known as Chanquillo, we feel it is a demonstration of exceptional astronomical knowledge, abilities far out of the reach of its currently academically claimed constructor. Rivaling even that of Stonehenge, it is an ancient monumental complex located along the Peruvian coastal desert in a place known as the Casma Sichin Basin within the Ancash department of Peru. Atop a hill, there are 13 towers regularly spaced, forming a toothed horizon. What is incredible about this undertaking, however, is that throughout the year, if one is positioned in the correct place, one can witness the sunrises between each of these ridges, with solstices also significantly highlighted by their builders. The question is, how did a people placed centuries ago within known history, and thus, with a far more limited understanding of astronomical precisions, accomplish the building of such an enormous ruin, aligned with the sun with such accuracy? Just like that of the precision displayed in other ancient ruins, perfectly aligned to cardinal points, the Chanquillo is yet another example of an ancient civilization's workmanship, far more advanced and far more capable than that of the culture academia currently claims as the maker of said relic. From the east and west, investigators designated two possible observation points. From these vantages, the 300-meter-long spread of the towers corresponds to the rising and setting positions of the sun over the year. On the winter solstice, the sun would rise behind the leftmost tower of Chanquillo and rise behind each of the towers until it reached the rightmost tower six months later on the summer solstice. Inhabitants of Chanquillo would have been able to determine the date with an accuracy within a day or two simply by observing the sunrise or sunset from these correct observational points. The 13 towers have been interpreted as an astronomical observatory built in the 4th century BC. However, we believe, with such incredible abilities and knowledge of the processional positions required to have constructed these towers, they are far out of the reach of our own well-studied currently claimed ancient ancestors. Claimed as that of the Chasma Sichin culture, we however disagree with this posit, simply on the grounds of its astonishing nature and the capabilities of its past constructor. It is a place which we find highly compelling. Like that of the crop circle, they are looked upon with an air of cynicism. The ley line is another intriguing theory that once one begins to dig into, finds the work of passionate, revered, and highly capable individuals, individuals who pursued the subject with hunger. One begins to see a rather compelling and convincing side to the field of study, which the deeper one digs into, the more convinced one can become. The Earth Mysteries Movement Much of modern culture is aware of the rebellious nature during the 60s. People rebelled in many ways, and the music became legendary. However, what many people may not be aware of is that there is also a rebellion within academic archaeology. John Mitchell, 
was one particular individual who played a major role in promoting a belief in ley lines. His respect as status risked, as we have discussed many times. For if one even in the most established of positions can find their career disintegrate around them simply for not supporting currently funded paradigm. Yet regardless, John helped to professionalize the discipline. His acceptance, but more importantly, his valiant public exposure of his opinion, made the subject a movement, no longer a cynical pseudo-vocation, the transcendence of theory to reality for ley lines meant that it was no longer an amateur-dominated field of research. As one would imagine, the so-called ley lines, upon exploration, began to suggest that not only were they indeed real, but an ancient, advanced, lost, or possibly hidden civilization, not only built along them, but that evidence began to mount that, by doing so, energy fields not yet fully understood in the modern world were somehow being harvested or utilized by these ancient structures. Inevitably, this deepening of controversial conclusions made by many capable archaeologists they inevitably began to be battled against by mainstream institutions. It was in the latter decade that advocates of energy fields and their significance within an extremely ancient culture, who somehow knew of these complex grid systems, was ultimately the rub, as with the pyramids. It is the advanced nature of ancient ruins, later realized, which sentences said sight to dismissal, conspiracy, and ignorance by funded institutions. Thus, anyone who had researched and subsequently become convinced of ley lines began to be labeled as members of the counterculture, where, in the words of the archaeologist Matthew Johnson, quote, they were attributed with sacred significance or mystical power. Ruggles noted, in this period, ley lines came to be conceived as lines of power, the paths of some form of spiritual force or energy, accessible to our ancient ancestors, but now lost to narrow-minded 20th century scientific thought." End quote. It seems like the many other relics of an antiquity, which displayed extraordinary abilities and knowledge, must be brushed under the rug, regardless of the fact that anyone with even the smallest faculty of logic within their cranium can clearly see that there is a mountain of not only compelling evidence to suggest their existence, but that there is an equally large amount of information, due to restriction in many forms, yet to be understood. Ley lines have been subsequently characterized as a form of pseudoscience. Within the Skeptics' Dictionary, Robert Todd Carroll noted, that none of the claims about magnetic forces underpinning putative ley lines have been scientifically verified. Williamson and Bellamy characterize ley lines as, quote, one of the biggest red herrings in the history of popular thought. One criticism of Watkins' theory stated that given the high density of historic and prehistoric sites in Britain and other parts of Europe, finding straight lines that connect sites is trivial and ascribable to coincidence. Johnson stated that, quote, ley lines do not exist. He cited Williamson and Bellamy's work in demonstrating this, noting that their research showed how the density of archaeological sites in the British landscape is so great that a line drawn through virtually anywhere will clip a number of sites. In 2004, John Bruno Hare wrote, quote, Watkins never attributed any supernatural significance to lays. He believed that they were simply pathways that had been used for trade or ceremonial purposes, very ancient in origin, possibly dating back to the Neolithic, certainly pre-Roman. His obsession with lays was a natural outgrowth of his interest in landscape photography and love of the British countryside. He was an intensely rational person with an active intellect, and I think he would be a bit disappointed with some of the fringe aspects of ley lines today." End quote. As one can see, there are many passionate dismissals of the existence of ley lines. And as our regular viewers will know, whenever we see such passionate denials, such encouragements to not even touch upon said research of a subject, a subject one can quickly prove to be possibly real, well, we find such highly compelling. The ancient ruins of Giza, perhaps the most incredible of them all, and possibly the clearest displays of academic conspiracy, with much of the most puzzling of areas all but closed off, away from public view. 
an attempt to stifle controversial questions, which inevitably arise from such baffling ancient wonders. However, this attempt to obscure the greatest aspects of ancient Giza just fans the flames of curiosity. For when one realizes that much of ancient Egypt is being actively covered up, so-called officials avoid any obligation to explain the methodology. Behind many constructions found on the plateau, structures and relics, which to this day, escape any logical explanation. Once one accepts this reality, one begins to wonder what unspoken motivation there could be to ardently hide these sites' true characteristics. We have in the past covered many areas of ancient Giza, which cannot be explained. Many people are aware of the issues surrounding the construction of the pyramids, and the largely exposed void in modern understandings. However, this conundrum is but one among a smorgasbord of highly intriguing yet no less mystifying features hidden in plain sight all over the plateau. The basalt floor, which still contains volumes of tool marks, evident of high-precision, high-rotation ancient power tools. The gigantic megalithic blocks, each sunk flat, level with the base of the pyramids, which, although walked over by millions, have been largely overlooked by all. Some of these blocks, forming the immediate foundations of the pyramids, are similar in size to the pregnant woman of Baalbek, which is estimated to weigh some 1,000 tons. Additionally, all of these features, according to mainstream teachings, were created by the ancient Egyptians, a civilization we claim merely re-inhabited the site, like many others around the world. It is a fitting hypothesis, which if indeed the case, then all said tasks were undertaken and masterfully accomplished with nothing more than a set of soft copper tools. A clearly illogical hypothesis, disproven in many ways, one of which is by the main pink Aswan granite relics still in existence all over Egypt, which were all simply impossible to have created with just copper chisels, and our next artifact of interest is of no exception. This imposing altar was found at the west end of a passage, just outside the northern wall of the temple of King Amenemhat I. Originally, it is presumed that the altar once stood in the open court of the temple, with its roughly shaped lower part suggesting that it was sunk into the ground. A rectangular libation basin is carved into the top of the altar, as well as representations in flat relief of an offering mat containing two libation basins and three loaves of bread, the middle one incised with the king's throne, with the name Horus added, with the phrase, may he be given life forever, uncannily similar to long live the king. But I digress. At the center of the altar's front side, the incised birth name of the king Amenemhat, with rows of approaching fertility figures who are designated by inscriptions as personifications of gnomes, regional governorates of northern and southern Egypt. It is undoubtedly an incredible ancient artifact, one carved with such precision and artistic accuracy, and upon some of the hardest stone on earth, to suggest this was achieved with soft chisels is to us absurd. Who made the altar of Amenemhat? How did they carve it? An exquisite ancient relic which is, like much of ancient Egypt, highly compelling. One of the things crucial for any civilization to flourish is a steady and abundant supply of clean, fresh water. It is the lifeblood of our planet, arguably the most fought-over resource on Earth. Without it, crops fail, sewage is not effectively flushed away, and a lack of it will cause dehydration and death in an incredibly short space of time depending on where one were to find themselves. Thus, for our posit of ancient, advanced civilizations, with populations well into the millions, to hold any water, a civilization we believe continues to bestow upon us advanced knowledge, ingenious solutions to the most difficult of problems, such as water manipulation and the irrigation thereof, would be present. 
The management and general manipulation of water should in all accounts be present amongst these sites in which we claim to be the work of now lost civilizations, and that is indeed what one finds. There is endless discussion within peer-reviewed papers and academic circles by regurgitation, seemingly lacking the faculty for critical thinking as they continue to look upon these ingenious ancient solutions for getting water to places that it should simply not be as simply wonderful, all incapable of considering that these people who created these structures, although they did not build skyscrapers, may not have been of a primitive nature with far less capable tools than modern man, this again, I might add, a denial continued when one looks upon the size of megalithic blocks moved through these lost ages of antiquity. Yet I digress. The following ancient water technique is nothing short of astonishing, and the work that must have gone into its construction unimaginable. Not surprisingly, it is an ancient marvel that did not escape the attention of William R. Corliss. Known as Canots, they are literal underground ancient man-made rivers, built slightly underground for the purposes of shade from the searing sun, found in most of the locations you find the Canots. This of course also minimized evaporation considerably inevitably allowing the water to travel unimaginably further into dry and inhospitable locations. These ancient man-made oases, yet another example of not only ancient man's abilities, knowledge, and dedication to overcome obstacles, but also a clue as to how many people these, what we believe are now lost civilizations who abruptly vanished, housed at an unknown time in history. For such enormous volumes of water are only needed for an equally enormous population, possibly once located somewhere nature wouldn't have allowed, yet with their advanced knowledge of irrigation systems, they flourished within. Canots are yet another incredible remnant left by an advanced civilization, which we undoubtedly find incredibly compelling. We are often confronted with peculiar, seemingly impossible artifacts that will, after some in-depth investigation, leave one with more questions than answers. This, either due to their enormous, often seemingly impossible sizes, megaliths in some locations weighing far over 1,000 tons, somehow, once used in their construction, sometimes set aloft, proof that not only were these stones hewn but moved and lifted seemingly with ease. But also, alas, the lack of public exposure many said sites are granted, often minimal at best, thus countless examples of advanced ancient technology remain still hidden here upon our planet. As a consequence, many have avoided scrutiny. Details therein which are clearly of a controversial nature are conveniently absent any funded studies of said ruins. We feel ruins of great importance but due to the strength of evidence one can surmount in support of past, once highly advanced ancient civilizations at said locations, they are largely overlooked and actively avoided by funded archaeologists, academics, and historians alike en masse. Simply ignored, thus preventing all from what we feel is a birthright, an accurate, warts and all, transparent exploration of the origins of humanity, and in turn, the history of our planet. Allowing one and all to make up their own minds in regard to the origin of said sites, no matter how controversial. This is the exact reason for the channel's creation, and is the driving force behind the six books one intends to write. A revolutionary cataloging of once, yet no more, deliberately overlooked or academically dismissed sites, dotted all over the world. For when one explores our content, they will be made aware of a smorgasbord of unique and often inexplicable features which can be found all over Earth. In addition, it is not just the visible feats of ancient stoneworking that are the singular astonishing legacy left by a now lost, once highly advanced ancient civilization. For there are many other feats accomplished in a bygone era. Prehistoric mine shafts can still be found in many areas of Earth. Not only are there still existing, seemingly machine-cut, extremely ancient, incredibly deep mineshafts 
in a number of areas of Earth, including those featured found within Tel Aviv, are all but one among many relics, all clearly left by a capable group hidden from the world. But ancient cities exist also, ones covered previously, which were all once somehow cut from Earth's bedrock, that due to their location have fortunately been explored by a number of individuals over the years, never funded, but merely driven by curiosity. Thus, the true astonishing depth, and indeed the incredible achievement these once were, has all been previously documented. Civilizations that were once capable of not just digging these mines to incredible depths, but were, in fact, capable of creating entire temples from one gigantic solid stone, cut with such incredible artistic ability and accuracy, they are staggering examples of ancient engineering. In China and Japan, gigantic megaliths left, mysteriously abandoned, Easter Island, the unfinished obelisk Aswa, Egypt, Yangshan Quarry within China, all abandoned, with Yangshan possessing an almost detached megalith, clearly cut using incredible stone-cutting tools, a block estimated as weighing 16,000 tons when liberated from the bedrock. All these anomalies are but a few examples which support the premise of lost technology, knowledge, and an advanced civilization. It seems that the advanced mines, like those found in Tel Aviv, are but a tip of an archaeological iceberg in regards to the mystifying stone-cutting of a now lost antiquity. Why did humans placed within a lost chapter of antiquity exert such back-breaking effort in the attempt of extracting these precious metals? Who dug the Tel Aviv mines? Was it the same group who built ancient Peru? We find the evidence to suggest such highly compelling.